basically the south and north is itself immense and so naturally you borrow from uh, those with more but because of the nature of capitalism that sets in stone that relationship and so debt leads to more debt uh, you have to um, uh, increase exports of certain things decrease exports other th of other things increase ex imports of certain things depending on who's got what within the eurozone and uh, so for example Greek exports collapsed under the euro so instead of you know you're getting Greece of all countries importing olives and things like that I mean which is which, which is which is of course is completely absurd so for the first thing we need to understand is the overall nature of the debt and how going into a currency like the euro was always going to be a total catastrophe for Greece regardless of the question of being in the EU and, and being, you know, together with other countries and so on, because we don't advocate a, you know, a nationalist isolationism, but the mechanism of the euro is always going to be catastrophic for Greece. Secondly, I think there's a couple of other things worth, worth noting, and, and I think they're worth noting for us understanding the solution to crises, as, as well as the causes of crises. In the whole post-World War II period, Greece has had uh, defence spending um, of around 5% um, of GDP, which is double the average in Europe of around 2.5% of GDP. Uh, why? Uh, it's to do with NATO, the Cold War being on a border with Eastern Europe, which was supposedly the, the communist enemy, and being on a border with Turkey, which was supposedly the nationalist enemy. And of course, these, this idea of concept of enemies was something encouraged by NATO precisely in order to sell more weapons to Greece. Now, it's been calculated that if you look at the period since um, the end of the Civil War in 1949 up until now, that if Greek military spending had been 2.5, that is a gr European average, rather than 5%, um, the, um, the, the amount saved would cover the entire current Greek debt of 320 billion euro. Now, I'm not saying that explains the whole, I mean, obviously things are more complicated than that, but it, it's just, you know, a very, <laughs> a very solid example uh, of, of, of the question of, of, of socialist policies versus, versus reactionary capitalist policy. And another useful statistic here is that since we're talking about the concept of tax the rich, which is not a socialist concept, it's just a... Um, a good social democratic concept, uh, if you like. It's just social democrats don't implement it, but what I mean is <laughs> theoretically, right? Okay, okay, socialist concept is you nationalise the wealth. Here's a study done that where a yearly graduated tax on the net wealth of all individuals in excess of $100 million, 5% uh, on the excess of, of, um, of $500 million, and then 10% after that, okay? Within the 10% bracket alone, such a tax would only impact approximately 20,000 households, but would raise in excess of $300 billion in revenue. That is the Greek debt. Right. So I'm just saying, okay, when we talk about debt, we need to, first of all, you know, deconstruct this concept of debt. Okay. That it's, and, and remember that this is just um, a, a concept within the capitalist and, and imperialist um, uh, set up. Let's now just look at this, the problem, what occurred. So, did, did Tsipras have any choice at the point in which he accepted this, this horrible deal? Um, uh, I, I think he did, but honestly, I don't think, I, I think our criticism needs to go back um, a lot further. Um, I, I'm of the view that we've been too uncritical over time. And when I say uncritical, I don't mean, I don't mean that we should have been coming out and saying, you know, denouncing cities or any of that sort of nonsense. I think we're correct to, you know, that this is a, this is a, a fantastic process and we should be part of it. Um, but I, I tend to feel that we, we because of that, we tend, we tend to get into a view that therefore, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be looking for things that we're do, that uh, they're doing wrong or, or, or could be done differently because you you tend to be oh well, that's sectarianism I don't think it is I think sectarianism is the way you do it 
if you get out and denounce and so we know better and all that kind of stuff like like some other left groups okay that's sectarianism but i think we get into a bit of a mindset of saying well um, they're, they're operating in, the, in these horrendous circumstances, you know, their choices are very limited, they're doing as best that they can, they're, they're, they're decent, obviously decent, committed people, and all of that's true, and therefore we get into a mindset of, of not, not, not that our criticisms are, are, are going to make an effect, we don't deliver them and say, oh, you've you got to do this, but rather just in terms of understanding um, what, you know, we, I, I don't think we've really, you know, understood uh, wh why we got to this if, if we can understand how bad it is now why why didn't we have a clue six months ago or a year ago I, I think that's our problem mine e everybody's that's looked at it right um, the, I mean Syria to come is uh, you know the dominant group in Syria is, is, is Sinaspismos uh, which was a, a, a pro-European reformist uh, modernizing organization and if I just put it that way it sounds something terrible which it was but the difference is that there was a split in Syriza in in Sinaspismos and the right wing split away they formed a little group called Democratic Left Dimar who are now irrelevant all right and therefore the mo we, we looked at the momentum of a split yes there's there was a momentum the Tsipras people were much much to the left of the traditional Sinaspismos, they joined up with the rest of the radical left, so he's like, this is a great process. Yes, yes, that's good, okay. However, w the, the problem is there was still a certain reformist outlook from within that group. I don't mean reformist in the sense of how we, we usually use it, as in traitors, no. I simply mean a point of view, right, that's all I mean, a point of view that we can try and do things through the system um, and in this case that meant through the European system was it wrong to try to do things through the European system not not entirely of course because as I said before we're not nationalists we don't think Greek capitalism on its own is the answer right I think with this the struggle to get a better deal from within um, the EU was was a good one and I think that Tsipras and, 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 and Varoufakis led it well as far as that goes. The problem was that they always, both Tsipras and Varoufakis, in fact Varoufakis in particular, um, had always had a view that there is nothing other than Europe. Uh, that that uh, there was no plan B create, there was no, there was no plan B. Uh, and what I mean by Plan B is not something done in the last couple of weeks. I mean, the Varoufakis idea a couple of weeks before of and doing all that, that's a fine idea, but that's very, 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 very late in the picture. Um, what I mean is th this, this concept that if you don't operate within Europe, well, there's nothing else. <coughs> we prefer to operate within, we, we prefer to try to get socialism, <laughs> to try to win victories within a bigger ground. Yes, that's true. Um, the you know the point of view that you have to get out of EU now, the KKE sort of point of view was was always just a schema and it was just a sectarian schema to not take part, right? Um, the problem is that doesn't mean doing the opposite can't all also be a schema that you can only do Europe. I mean it's tactical, all right? And the problem was that from very early on it was obvious that the EU leadership, the imperialist leadership of the EU was going to block you every step of the way. Um, now we didn't have a plan B either politically, as, as Viv said, encouraging a discussion within society or technically of actually building up um, the basis um, uh, of, uh, of for uh, a Grexit should it become necessary. Therefore, I, I, I tend to be not so critical of Tsipras right at the last moment. I mean, of course, he's wrong. I mean, you can't be implementing austerity. You have to resign. Mm. You can't implement it, right? It's ridiculous. But honestly, at that last moment on the precipice, it's actually true to say he had the choice between accepting this new memorandum whereby he becomes a satrap for a, you know, an imperial project, right? He, uh, he becomes a, the head of a colony, right? Or um, an immediate unplanned Grexit where there's nothing in the banks. And so you can say, oh, be socialist, nationalise the banks. Great, nationalise nothing, right? And, and have nothing and, 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 and people have nothing. So, I mean, there was actually, you know, I think right at that moment, it, <laughs> you know, that, that's probably, 
the, the point where um, you really had the least choice, but that's because nothing had been built um, all the way along. Um, and that was, in my opinion, partly because of illusions. Now, I, know, I, I don't think it's as simple as that, and it's, and it's easy for us to, to, to say all of this, but I mean, you know, there is a discussion among economists well, the Viv said she's not an economist. Well, neither am I. But you know, there is a discussion among economists that on on these kind of questions. Now, now Vatelfarty said that there was a a small plan B, uh, and he said that um, he said that uh, you know they were going to a couple of weeks before. No, he said he said yeah he, they had a very small plan B. Uh, but he said it was a small team in secret who created, and he said that Tsipras uh, had to, gave the go-ahead for this even before the, they were elected, right, to create a plan in case we were forced to exit. Uh, of course, there's a conundrum here. Once this plan begins to be implemented, once you go from five people working on it mm -hmm. to 500, which is the minimum you need to implement it, it becomes public knowledge. The moment it becomes public knowledge, the power of prophecy creates a dynamic of, of its own. We never made that transition from five to five hundred. We never felt we had a mandate to do it. We never planned to do it. We had the design on paper, but it was never activated. Now, in my opinion, this was wrong. Um, I agree with Marty Hart Landsberg, who wrote an excellent article on this issue, which, which, which was in links, and he says, but that was a mistake. Planning should have happened on a large scale and in a visible way. Discussions should have been held with international legal experts as well, as with BRICS countries. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit iffy on that, whatever, okay. okay. But there was no need to keep this planning quiet, quite the opposite. Eurozone leaders should have been made aware that Syriza was seriously studying its alternatives. They should have been made aware that Syriza thought it actually did have uh, alternatives. And the population should have been brought along. The government would do all in its power to stay in the Eurozone as long as this was consistent with an end to austerity. Um, and I believe that to a large extent it was um, ideology that prevented this from happening. Um, now there may be other economic and legal stuff and and so on, but uh, you know the fact that people are arguing this and people that do seem to know what they're talking about. Uh, I think the political point there is you don't hide it, but on the contrary, you let them know that you have alternatives. Um, um, the other, one of the other things is that uh, Syriza has been criticised uh, by others on the left. Um, Syriza, its positive is that it came out of the mobilisations of the last five years, so it was seen as sort of you know part of this mobilisation process. But once it took power. Once it was elected, it's been criticised uh, quite a bit for uh, not not for essentially avoiding uh, the popular mobilisations going on. Now, of course, it's a bit difficult from over here to say that's true just because someone says it. But I mean, it's been said enough for me to for me to believe that there's some truth in it. Um, and it seems to me that probably the whole you know having to put so many eggs in, in the basket of arguing with the EU and everybody focused on that probably did detract a little bit from the... But, you know, I'm, I'm not... You know, then again, it's it, it's a little bit difficult to criticise when you simply don't know. I mean, it's a big party and probably a lot of people were involved in, the, in this popular mobilisation. But we do hear, think, do hear things which I think probably we should have studied a little bit more. Um, the other thing is that when uh, Syriza first came in, into the, the limelight a few years ago with the big uh, election, they had a much more radical program than now. Um, over the last year or so, they've essentially dropped it. Um, I'm not sure that we've really um, looked at that. I mean, I'm not saying you have to go into with the maximum program, obviously. Um, uh, but uh, it basically went from a program which involved nationalising banks and and uh, and a number of other large industries, um, very very large taxes on the rich, um, 
uh, very large cuts to defence spending, exit from NATO, and all, all, all these other things to, to the minimum program that we know is the Thessaloniki program. Now, it's good to have a minimum program as, a, you know, like your immediate, what, what, what's going to be the immediate. So, and cities, it was very, let's be, let's be honest, cities was very, very good at that. The, all, the, all, all those immediate things, you know, the, the food, the electricity, the housing stuff, well, they did that straight away. I mean, that, that was very, very good, all right? Um, I, I haven't really, you know, got, got a very clear picture of uh, why the rest of it was essentially dropped. Is it, is it because they thought, well, that's too radical for now, we can't put it forward now? Um, maybe to some extent, uh, but it, it seems to me that there was a, it, there's almost a difference of night and day. Um, I think that it is needed to put capital controls, and this isn't a socialist measure, this is simply a measure to protect your economy, it needed to put capital controls on, so that, because what they're confronted with is all this, these euros just exiting Greece. And everyone's saying, oh, well, you can't do anything about that because that's globalisation, that's the rules, and, oh, oh, hang on, the Troika wants its money back, and we're letting money fly out of Greece because they don't want to be taxed, yeah. right? Surely you can argue with the Troika, even on their own terms, no, yes, this might be against the rules, but this is because we want to be responsible. I mean, you know, when the Troika, when they closed down the Greek banks before the referendum, that, that, that put capital controls on. I mean, they did it themselves. I, 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 can't, I, you know, I can't conceive that for six months, Euro were allowed to fly out of Greece and, and, um, and the left government didn't uh, impose capital controls and argue for it even in the terms of the of, of the troika, um, yes, they would have got into trouble. Yes, there's all oh, you can't do that. That's wrong. But, but I mean, it, it would be very hard, I think, for them to say no, no. You've got to let it all go, even though we want our money back. It's, um, that put, let let them have the contradiction. Um, anyway, look, I'm just putting forward some ideas, and I'm not I'm not uh, absolutely certain on all of this. I just think we need to have a bit of a hard look at the last couple of years and try and understand why we why we are where we are now but we seemed to have no idea before uh, for example before we said well um, they shouldn't just exit the EU and I agree with that they should if they're going to get kicked out it's better to get kicked out because they're pushing forward with their policies and they kick them out yes that's true but if you got kicked out and you had nothing would that have been what we're saying is that that's going to be a disaster. So we, I don't, you know, even even saying that, and I said it a lot of times, right? Right. I mean, uh, you know, how how thought through is it? One thing. Uh, also, I this is this is just something that um, maybe maybe you can. This is out of left field, but um, the the difference within the the EU that we've referred to, where um, where Germany and some countries had a hard line, and in particular, even within Germany. The hardest line was the finance minister, Schauble. He hated Greece and he wanted it out of the, the EU. And he wanted it out so much that he put forward the proposal right near the end that we will allow you to exit, we will help you exit, we, we will help you carry out a transitioned exit, not a sudden total collapse. We will help you avoid a collapse, right? Right, and if you do that, if you get out, because we want you out so much, we will then only if you get out, then we will reduce the debt. And of course, Schauble is seen as the arch enemy of the Greek people, and he is. But I honestly just wonder: is it, <laughs> considering the two alternatives I just noted before, is, isn't aren't there times when maybe a manoeuvre by your arch enemy? might be a better thing to grab onto. They're doing it for their reasons and you for you, you're gonna maneuver. I honestly wonder if it wasn't the best, um, uh, the best possibility at the time. I mean, probably he would have, they would have, you know, made a whole lot of other things difficult, I'm sure. But the, 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 whole, the whole problem is that being in the Euro, you simply have no, no room to maneuver at all. It's someone else's currency. It seems that, you know, in the world as we have with globalisation, with you know, yes, of course we understand all governments have got to compromise. That's why Cuba has to compromise, all that, we know that. But at least, 
you got a little bit of wiggle room. The Euro gave you none at all. And it seemed to me that even though it would have been a struggle, that might have actually been um, a little bit better. But I'm sure, you know, if, if probably Durian was here, he'll tell me that's wrong. And so, you know, it, whatever, I'm sure someone will tell me it's wrong. Um, but nobody really knows what's, what's right. So all we know is that now we're here, and I think and, and Vivian gave a good account of what, you know, what the various alternatives are now. Um, I want to touch on the question of what did the no vote mean? Um, um, now, Viv said it, Greeks want to stay in the EU. Well, you know, Viv's just been over to Greece, and I haven't, and, and she's probably got, you know, a finger on the pulse a little <laughs> bit better than me. I, I, I'm not sure that... Look, when you vote no, if 62% of the people vote no to an austerity package, it, it seems to me impossible that these... And then, and then polls show, allegedly show, that majority of people want to stay in the EU. I, I, it, it seems to me it's not possible that the contradiction is that total. I think people say yes, they want to stay in the EU ideally, but if they vote, if 62% vote no to this package and you have to accept this package to stay within the Eurozone, I, 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 I can't conceive that all of these 62% that, that Probably half of them, at least, weren't weren't aware that by voting no, they were, they were saying yes, we reject this austerity, even if it means getting out of the eurozone. Now, there's no way to measure that, but I mean, I I don't, I, 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 I don't accept that. Um, I, actually, I, and, and actually, there's there's alternative polls. Um, Pan European Gallup, December 2014, 52 percent favoured return to national currency. Um, bridging Europe poll March 2015, 53% in favour of Grexit. June 2015, bridging Europe poll, 63% not afraid of Grexit. Not supporting it, but not afraid of it. Now, that compares to other polls which says 80% support staying in the EU. I think people are confused. I don't think it's very simple. I think if you, yeah, if you ask them simply, would you prefer to stay in the Eurozone, they say, yes, we would. It's less disruptive, right? Okay, but I'm not. I'm not convinced that you know, do, if if the question was, do you want to stay in the eurozone, come what may, even if we drive you further into the ground, right? Uh, the, 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 that that would be the same figure. So I'm, I'm you know, I, I think you know the leadership was wrong to not open that debate. But I'm not sure that it's. I'm just not sure that it's that that clear as day that um, that the contradiction was that big. Now, uh, the the. What, 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 what's the situation now? I think Viv gave a pretty good account of that. Those staying in cities, are, are they all people who are supporting the, the current leadership? I suggest no. Um, but a lot of people are confused. They, they don't know what to do. Um, I, I think the left platform is, is probably, that's, that's, the, that's the key large group that's out there uh, fighting for austerity. Is the, you know, the front for Ohi front for no that's that's I think that's basically uh, where we are at the moment however within cities I think there'll still be a hell of a lot of people who are uh, not happy with the situation but think they can still fight within it all right the cities of people themselves they're what you know their argument is well this is all really bad but um, we will we will try to um, make up for for all the bad things that are going to happen we will ease the negative impact by doing other things. Um, well, they might do a little bit of that, but of course it's an illusion fundamentally that you know, if you're going to implement this, uh, this colonial program, um, whatever you can do to make up for it will still need money. I, I, you know, it doesn't, um, you know, if you're going to cut pensions with one on the one hand and then give them something on the other hand, well, where's that money going to, I mean, it, I, I don't think, uh, and, and it's not going to make any difference because even if they did implement it in a slightly nicer way to pass off a new democracy, that's not something people are going to be able to see in front of them. What they'll see is a left government implementing um, this horrible neoliberal program and that the, the political impact of that is, is going to be worse than anything. If there's no alternative, they should resign, um, which is a pretty hard thing to say in some ways, but I can't see any um, But if Aki's, uh, says that he won't join the left uh, platform because of fundamental disagreements uh, that is over the question of Europe. And instead he's launching a pan-European anti-austerity movement. Um, I, I, uh, I can't see that that's going to go anywhere. 
Um, I, I, I don't know what that means. Because if you're going to have a movement, well, it'll have to be based on real parties and movements, which in Greece, it would seem to me at the moment, would fundamentally be the left platform or others who around that. So I, don't, I mean, it's... I, I can't see that going anywhere. Um, um, <coughs> if uh, if Zoe Constantopoulou sets up her own party, I think that would be mad, and I hope she doesn't do that. I hope she joins the left the left platform. Uh, we don't need more parties, um, uh, and presumably those fifty three resign. I think some of them. Uh, it says that, as far as I understand, the majority have already joined Popular Unity. According to to Adam Roris, um, who I tried to get here today, but but he couldn't make it. Um, uh, there are people still in Syriza who who put forward their own sort of um, alternative, which is something along the lines of um, we're against what's going on, um, uh, but we we've got no alternative at the moment to. Um, uh, to trying to uh, fight for a different course uh, within the within the ranks and within the the popular movements. As there, is this guy uh, Andreas Karitsis? Is there any room for manoeuvre? Yes, if we're determined and systematic enough to work under the radar's neoliberal configuration, inventive enough to formally coincide with it, while at the same time we empower people against it, and decisive enough to not give in to threats and blackmail. In other words, okay. They should be working with other people, with the workers, to mobilise against it. So we're not talking about the tip of the leadership. We're talking about people who have decided to stay in Syria at the moment. In order to respond adequately to these suffocating conditions, new organisational standards and methods are needed for the engagement of thousands of people in this day-to-day -day struggle. Um, <coughs> negatively put, without the people, with the knowledge needed, aligned into groups of collaboration and embedded in a vast network of democratic decision-making, that produces policies of our own logic, no government will be in a position to wage this battle. So that I don't know how successful it's going to be. I'm just saying there does appear to be a current within Syriza, not the leadership, who who think that they can still maintain that struggle on the ground. And there's others that that sort of say sort of say similar things. Of course we still have the the, the um you know, the solidarity for all, uh, the, the, the movement on the ground to building uh, solidarity and so on. Uh, what should we do? Uh, uh, yeah, that, 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 that is a very difficult question at the moment. Um, uh, you know, we, we put forward the idea e e even earlier of trying to build solidarity with these grassroots solidarity um, for all groups in, in Greece that are, you know, providing medical care and, and all the rest of it, and not, not just from the point of view of charity, but from the point of view of, you know, of making that a, a political thing to, 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 um, <coughs> to highlight the political issues. I think that's probably even more important now. I think, I think we've got to kind of, if, if we can do that, I mean, if there are people around to do that, uh, you know, to highlight, highlight all these facts that this, you know, like we've said, this is nothing to do with workers in Greece being lazy and, and and all that stuff. To make to bring these points back here, that this is absolutely the opposite, right? That it's still there's a lot of disinformation in the community, and that that misinformation plays directly into the hands of neoliberal nonsense. Whereas in fact, it's precisely the neoliberal austerity and the fact that Greeks do work longer hours, do get paid less, have less holidays. Uh, lower pensions and all, all the opposite of what they're saying, precisely because of that, that you're in this situation. And I think that you build solidarity and you highlight these facts and, 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 and so on. Um, anyway, there's probably a million other things I could say, but I'll just leave it there for discussion. Yeah? Right.